Family Theater presents Bob Hope and Raymond Burr. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents Journey of the Pegasus, starring Raymond Burr. And now, here is your host, Bob Hope. Thank you, Tony LaFrano. Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives. If we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world, Family Theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our transcribed drama, Journey of the Pegasus, starring Raymond Burr as Pete Schwartz. I want to tell you about something that took place. To be exact, it took place during the third week of July in the year 1962. The flight of the spaceship Pegasus on its first trip to the moon. This is Howard Culver in the takeoff area. Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard from some of the leading astronomers, from our military leaders concerning the strategic importance of the moon and the importance of this first trip to our satellite. From my vantage point here, the Pegasus bears little resemblance to her namesake, the winged horse of Greek mythology. Though this Pegasus, too, seems close to being mythological, the size is absolutely fantastic. 286 feet from the needle-sharp prow to the trailing edge of its dorsal fins. Its highly polished hull picks up and reflects the many hundreds of lights illuminating the takeoff area. And, oh, ladies and gentlemen, the two men who are making this historic journey have just left the briefing room and are coming this way. I'll see if I can get them for you. Uh, gentlemen, uh, Mr. Schwartz, uh, Mr. Friend, would you step over here for a moment? Thank you. Well, gentlemen, how does it feel to be selected as the first men to view the moon at close range? Well, I, uh, I think it's going to be a pretty wonderful experience. Yeah, like taking a plane to Paris, only more so. <laughs> a little farther, too. Yeah, a little. 249,000 miles to our landing point. And uh, how long do you think it'll take for the complete trip? Exactly five days, nine hours, and 23 minutes. The navigation was plotted months ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, how long will you actually stay on the moon? Four hours. As Pete says... Just like changing, changing trains, trains in Chicago. Chicago. Yeah, only more so. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you mean. Now, this will be the first time anyone has had a chance to see the other side of the moon. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, we hope to bring back some specimens, but mostly pictures so that maps can be made for future explorers. Uh-huh. Uh, now, just how did you happen to be selected for this first uh, Earth-to-moon expedition? Uh, you first, Mr. Friend. Uh... Well, I've been with the project since the beginning, back in 1958, and I guess you could say I'm a propulsion fuels expert. But actually, since the peg will be radar control from Earth most of the time, I'm almost excess baggage. Oh, then you won't really be piloting the Pegasus. Only when she's on the dark side, out of line of sight with Earth. That will automatically break radar contact. Mm -hmm. I'll fly it then, and of course for the landing. Now, Pete here will be doing most of the work. Uh, you're going to do the photography, Mr. Schwartz? That's about what my ticket will cost me. We'll be using a new type of film, which probably wouldn't exist except for Pete here. Oh, is that so? Well, the world's been kicking the idea around for more than 100 years. It's a film emulsion made from a special kind of dye. Uh-huh. Uh, well, gentlemen, I know you've been asked this before, but is there any chance of your finding a, a form of life on the moon? No, it's very unlikely. Luna has no atmosphere at all. That alone would keep life from existing. If there is, though, I'll try to bring you back autographed pictures. <laughs> <laughs> well, I may hold you to that. Well, gentlemen, we know you have some goodbyes to say before you prepare to take off. Uh, we'll be following your history-making journey on the radar screen, and well, perhaps we'll be able to talk to you in flight. I hope sure, so. That's possible. Good luck and Godspeed to both of you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Uh, one of the men chiefly responsible for the development of the Pegasus is at my side now. His name is John Howard DeMarc. Uh, 
Dr. DeMarc and his staff will keep a constant radar watch while... Your wife asked me to tell you she'd wait in the briefing room, Pete. Dr. Thanks. Will we be able to use you know, Dick, it's a funny thing. All these months of preparation, and now I don't want to go. You know why? Why? Because of Caroline. I guess I've kind of taken her for granted, but now... All of a sudden, well, I... Yeah, 249,000 is a lot of miles. Oh, you're not going to cry, are you? I I'm only going to be gone five and a half days. Wouldn't you be disappointed if I didn't cry a little? Uh, uh, look, I made you a little... a little something for the trip... Did you? It's not very much, just a little nut bread and some cold chicken and things. I thought you and Dick might... Oh, Pete. Oh, come on now, take it easy. I'm all right. Uh, let's see what you put in here. Oh, no, don't open it now. It's not very much. Well, I'll, I'll bring you back some green cheese. There's only one thing I want you to bring me, Pete. Oh, don't worry, honey. This ship is foolproof. DeMarc has taken us through it a thousand times. Oh. Please be careful. Because if anything happened to you, I... Well, I wouldn't even know how to live anymore. Oh, baby. Pete, promise me you'll take care. Promise me you'll... you'll now, be... now, listen. Nothing's going to happen. I I'll come back. And that's a promise. <laughs> How do you feel? How do I feel? Strapped flat in my back in a ship that's going to the moon? I feel scared. How else could I feel? <laughs> How do you feel? Yeah, about the same. I'd like Hello, to... Hello, Pegasus. This is Control. You have one minute till primary ignition. Are you in position? Yeah, yeah, already. Yeah, that's right. Treat him rough. I ought to be working in a little photography shop somewhere. Baby pictures, that's my game. In no event are either of you to move during acceleration. Understand? We understand. Stand by. Have I time to say something to them? You better make it fast, Doc. What gives? It's to Mark. Boys. Uh, yeah, Doc? Uh, can Dick hear me, too? Right here, Doctor. I just wanted to say good luck once more. I don't have to tell you how much depends on this. Uh, we know, Doc. And remember, remember, when you switch over from radar control to manual on the dark side of Luna, use the checklist. Don't leave it to memory. It's too risky. We'll use the list. Now that switchover is going to be the tricky part. Uh, so I'm you... sorry, Doctor. 35 seconds. Stand by. See your wife all right, Pete? 30 seconds. Uh, I saw her. Greatest wife a man ever had. You know that, Dick? 25 seconds. You're a lucky man, Pete. Uh, yeah, I sure am. 20 seconds. 249,000 is a lot of miles. 15 seconds. 498,000, Pete. Round trip. You gotta remember, it's Ten, round trip. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4... Three, two... At 7.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, the Pegasus passed through the troposphere and entered the stratosphere. Then at 7.38, the Pegasus left the ionopause, the outer edge and the final layer of gases making up the atmosphere of Earth. That's about it, Dr. DeMarc. They must be in outer space. We've lost our light on television. Coming through fine on radar, sir. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, here's their blip on horizontal. Mm -hmm. And on vertical, here, sir. Uh-huh. Fine. Slowing down for the last few seconds. Seem to be leveling off now. Uh, leveling? They, uh, they don't have any level where they are. No up, no down, and no reverend except Earth. Now, if anyone uh, calls, I'm going to stop by the control transmitter for a minute and... Uh, then I'll be in the radio room. Yes, sir. And, sir. Yes? Give them our best. Yes, indeed. At 7.45, radio contact was established and instrument readings were exchanged along with other information. Hello, Pegasus. 
Can you see the Earth? Can you describe it from where you are? Dick, you tell him, Pete. You're the artist. I'm only an engineer. Hello, Pegasus. We heard you. We were discussing the appearance of Earth shortly before you made contact. Yes, it, it, it looks a little like... like a honeydew melon that's gone bad. Sorry, but that's the way it looks from here. Some think it looks like that from here, too. Hello, Pegasus. We're going to cut you into the pool radio networks in a couple of minutes, so that the citizens on this... this overripe melon can hear from you two heroes. It's not likely that we'll be able to continue using radio for very long. The fellow asked for questions to be Oh, what gives? That's, uh... You, you mean no more radio? So soon? So soon. Ten years ago, radio wouldn't have been able to carry this far. The outer layer of atmosphere, the ionosphere, reflects almost all radio waves. Well, what do we do now? Just settle down to the business at hand, I guess. Which is what? Being heroes. Oh, nuts. I'm not the hero type. I wouldn't make the grade, not even if I discovered DeMarc's secret of the universe in a fistful of ready-made maps. <laughs> Guys named Schwartz never get the breaks in the hero business. How so? Can you imagine a hero named Schwartz? Of course you can't. Buck Schwartz in the 20th century. Space Cadet Schwartz, reporting, sir. Or in those old westerns, Tech Schwartz or Hopalong Schwartz. <laughs> Ever know of any great generals named Schwartz? Yeah, I see what you mean. Hey, Dick. Caroline gave me a box of cold chicken and stuff. You want some? Sure, good idea. Break out the goodies. From 8.05 to 8.45, the first men to address outer space feasted on homemade nut bread and southern fried chicken. They washed it down with a well-known American soft drink. From 8.45 until 10.30, they sat before the starboard port and engaged in speculative conversation about the moon. Then, they went to bed. Pete, you awake? Yeah. I'm so tired I can't keep my eyes open, but I can't turn off the thoughts. Yeah. It's about the same with me. Christopher Columbus Schwartz. <laughs> I'm afraid if I go to sleep, I'll miss something. In 1962, Pete Schwartz and Dick Friend sailed through outer space blue. Only it isn't blue, it's black. <laughs> Looks like you'll have to think up another one. Hey, what do you mean, miss something? You expecting something to happen? No, no. I guess I'm just too excited to sleep. One more piece of chicken. Wing, I think. No, thanks. You eat it. No, I don't want it. Hey, Dick, now let me get this straight. Except for me taking a few more pictures, nothing's going to happen until we land, right? Right. Except for the switchover. You sure about that? Almost positive. Oh, well, all right, then. See you in 10 or 15 hours. Uh, I'm going to have another crack at getting some sleep. After 57 hours and 10 minutes, the Pegasus' course changed as she moved toward the gravitational field of Luna and began circling to the dark side. Our scheduled time for breaking radar contact with the Earth was 57 hours and 13 minutes. It was almost time for the switchover. Three minutes, Pete. Gotcha. Ready with a checklist? All set. Let's have it. Item one, thrust control. Thrust control, check. Set stabilizer on automatic to cut in at 1070 MPH. Stabilizer set, 1070 MPH, check. Item two, time control. Time control, check. Start chronometer. Start chronometer. Two minutes from the switch point. We're all right. What's next? Set chronometer to cut in at 57.13.5. Chronometer set at 57.13.5. Check. Item three, external temperature control. Check. Set compensator at zero on ellipse graph. Compensator at zero. Check. Item four. What's that? Air resistance. We're getting closer to the Luna's field of gravity. Yeah. Well, I'll say we are. Hey, there's the one-minute signal. Go ahead, item four. Item four. Prime rockets number two, four, and six. Two. Four. Six. 
Two, four, six, check. 30 seconds. Fifth and last item. Prime rockets, one, three, and five. One, three, five. Check. That's everything. 15 seconds to the switch point. All set. Fire breaking rockets at 5710. Straight up. Four seconds from the time the blip goes out. Hey, you watch the trigger switch. I'll count it for you. Coming up. Coming up. Ready. Ready. One, two, three, fire. At 59 hours and 30 minutes, the descent began. Colored flares were fired at 5935, and pictures were taken of the lunar topography. <laughs> it's definitely not green cheese, huh, Dick? Hey, man, look at those craters grow. Yeah, they're gonna look a lot bigger before we're down. How long? About seven minutes. Disappointed? Disappointed? In what? This side looks just like the other side. No hidden valleys, no three-headed people rushing out to meet us. Hey, that flare's going out. You better fire another one. Green this time, right? Fifty-nine hours and forty-four minutes after leaving the geosphere of Earth, the spaceship Pegasus made the first physical contact with the moon. This chronicle, written as it was as the events took place, contained much information about that first walk on the moon in July of 1962. There were notes on terrain, grid coordinates, marking the places where specimens and photographs had been taken, and remarks about gravity. Altogether, 273 notes and observations set down in the careful, abbreviated hand of Richard Friend. But the most exciting entry concerned an incident that took place during our last half hour on the planet Luna. At about 63 hours and 50 minutes after leaving Earth, we'd taken about all the surface photographs and samples we could and were heading back to the peg. Everything was going along fine till we got about 100 or 150 yards from the ship. It was then that I thought I saw something moving around in the main compartment. I, I swear I saw it. it. Passed right by the port. But it doesn't stand to reason. Probably a reflection. Reflection of what? Dick, Dick, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I just didn't have an answer. Well, there can't be anybody here. But maybe we'd better have a look. I don't think we'll find anything. At the top of the metal ladder leading to the control compartment, we heard something moving around. And then, after a while, it was quiet. I guess... I guess we just open the hatch and march in. Hey, hey wait. Maybe we ought to do a little thinking first, huh? Hey, it couldn't be a stowaway. Oh, where could he have hidden? Yeah, that's right. Well... What are we going to do? Pete, the navigation schedule calls for us to take off in 23 minutes. It looks like there's only one thing we can do. You mean barge right in? Well, whose spaceship is it, anyway? Not a weapon between us. If we only had a gun. Shall I open the hatch? What else? The visitor was a man, a little short of middle age and well-built. He was sitting on the edge of my bunk, smiling when we looked in. For a moment, we just looked at each other. Then he walked over to give us a hand from the deck hatch. Hello? I was beginning to wonder if you were coming back. Pete, did, did you? I didn't say a word. It was him, but... He didn't even open his mouth. My language is thought. You have a spoken tongue? He did it again. Dick, did you hear that? I didn't hear a thing, but I know what he said. Because the stranger spoke in thought, it would be close to impossible to give you a literal account of the conversation, but I'll give it to you as well as I can. 
He was named after his profession, and he was a worker in metal foils, mostly gold foils, so Dick and I called him Goldsmith. It, it seemed all right with him. Won't you sit down, Mr. Goldsmith? Thank you. While I was waiting for you, I happened to notice this box. It has a very pleasant aroma. Oh, oh you mean the chicken wing. <laughs> Caroline will be flattered. It's food. Would you like to try it? I would like to take it with me to my own planet, if you don't mind. If it tastes as good as it smells, we may synthesize it, if I may. Uh, please do. Uh, be my guest. Yeah. What, uh... What brings you here, Mr. Goldsmith? Your flares were responsible for that. I was on my way home when I saw them. I thought I'd better stop by and see if you needed assistance. Uh, very neighborly. This being the solar system of the mad planet, I thought you might be in trouble. What do you mean, Mr. Goldsmith? What mad planet? You don't know, then? It's good I stopped by. There is a planet thought to be in this solar system, which is very dangerous. Dangerous? The inhabitants would kill a visitor without cause, as readily as they kill each other. The people are really mad? You mean insane? It would seem so. Almost from the instant human beings appeared on this planet, they've abused themselves and their world, inventing all sorts of ways to rationalize their actions. Perhaps I'm taxing your imagination. No, no, please continue. Well, it seems that on this planet, as on all the other inhabited ones, human beings were put to a test of love. Uh, and what happened? The people on the mad planet failed the test. They chose to hate rather than love. Why, that's terrible. What is even more terrible? They failed every test since that first one. It has always been incomprehensible to me. They had the chance to start out all over again. Their planet at one time was entirely covered with water. But one family, one good family, was allowed to survive. But still, even they put hate before love. What, what do you think will become of the people on the planet? Well, through their own doing, they themselves have invented a kind of partial punishment in which millions of them gather into sides and wage war on each other. Some oppress, some defend, but all suffer. According to our revelations concerning this strange planet, love is not dead there. And where there is love, there is hope. Why, have these people made any progress at all? That I do not know. I would like to think so. At any rate, I would not risk landing there if I were you. What was that? The alarm is to let us know we must leave in five minutes. Why five minutes? Uh, we, we have to do our navigation in advance. If we miss our schedule, we may miss our planet. To replete our course would take us weeks, and I'm afraid we're not prepared to stay that long. Oh. Then you are new to space travel. Uh, very new. Perhaps, perhaps you live in this solar system? That's right. Then I'm... I'm glad I talked to you. So am I. It occurs to me that we have excellent astronomers on our planet. Plotting your course back would be a matter of minutes for them. If you would care to visit with us for a time... Oh, thanks, but we're expected at home. At home. Before I go, you have given me something of value. Uh, chicken wing? Oh, forget it, please. No, no. I would like to give you something in exchange. It's in this case we carry these in my world to remind us of important facts. But I'm told its meaning is universal. Please accept it. But this is gold. Only the case. I made it myself. It looks much too valuable. The value is inside. There is a lesson inside the people of your world would profit by. Will you accept it? Yes, of course. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thanks. I took a picture of Goldsmith as he left the Pegasus. Three minutes after that, we left the moon and headed back toward Earth. One hundred and twenty-nine hours and twenty-three minutes after leaving Earth, the Pegasus returned. 
Most of the human race was excited about the specimens and the hundreds of pictures taken on the moon, but the most attention was given to the products of the last 10 minutes on Luna, to a, a photograph of a man who spoke in thought, and to a little gold case. It contained a reminder of a parable once set before men, a single mustard seed. For love is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man takes and sows in his field. This, indeed, is the smallest of all seeds. But when it grows up, it is larger than any herb and becomes a tree. This is Bob Hope again. You know, family theater has been plugging the slogan, the family that prays together stays together for even longer than Pittsburgh's been in the cellar. But when most of us think of families that don't stay together, we think of broken marriages. And that's not always the main problem. Our kids are just as much a part of the family as we are, and they need prayer as much as the rest of us. Pick up your tabloid. What do you read about? Kids. Kids coming home from Korea. Sure, they've packed a lot of living into a few years, but a lot of them are still kids, and they need all the help they can get. Turn to page two. More kids, some of them pretty far gone. Kids who've been duped into dope. Kids who pushed that hot rod of theirs just a notch too far, and at the last minute couldn't stop in time. And don't get me wrong, I'm not one of those guys who thinks the younger generation's getting worse every year. But I do think there's a way we could all help that generation to get a lot better. That's right through family prayer. The whole family, dad, mom, sis, brother, all hands, folded just long enough to thank God they're a family. And dad, good example is a mighty powerful thing. None of our old bones can take the punishment they used to, but if we pick out a soft spot on the carpet and let ourselves down easy, well, after all, God built our legs to bend at the knees, so he must have wanted us to spend some time in that position. And it works. The family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you Journey of the Pegasus, starring Raymond Burr. Bob Hope was your host. Others in our cast were Marvin Miller, Bob Bailey, Vivi Janis, Howard Culver, and Francis Urey. The script was written by Robert Hugh O'Sullivan, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman, and was directed and transcribed for Family Theater by Lou X. Landsworth. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program, by the mutual network which has responded to this need and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to be with us next week when family theater will present Turn On the Lights, starring John Hodiak. Tyrone Power will be your host. Join us, won't you? This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.